The history of food in the United States is one of the more complex histories in the entire world, with Earth's melting pot bringing together countless cultures and lifestyles to allow for any kind of cuisine you can think of, if only a few miles away. However, what would you say if we told you America hasn't always been home to any and every meal you could think of? In fact, go back more than a few decades and you probably wouldn't be able to recognize the food scene as it stands today. Needless to say, the culture of food, no matter what country or continent you hail from, has changed over the years, whether it's the way we eat, prepare, store, or source each of our meals. While the mass production of both farming and artificial processed foods has changed the way we eat, fast food, chain restaurants, and convenient dining hasn't always been possible, especially prior to the 20th century. Despite the differences in appearance, however, it doesn't remove the beauty and context hiding within every dish available to us throughout history. To learn more about the wonderful food seen across tables and campsites aplenty in 19th century America, here are types of popular foods from the Wild West. Our first meal actually goes well beyond the days of Manifest Destiny in the 1800s and into the earliest recordings of indigenous tribes flocking the Great Plains of America. Pemmican is a combination of rendered fat and dried meat, occasionally mixed with dried berries. It's served either raw or with a prepared meal, and it was often used as an energy-enriching cuisine and staple to any gathering or shared eating space. Pemmican was invented by the indigenous plains tribes in North America. However, the exact time it was introduced, or officially invented, is up to debate by scholars. Most pemmican recipes involve the meat used from bison, moose, deer, and elk varieties. However, this specific dish will be centered on from the perspective of Native American buffalo hunters. First, those tasked with killing the bison had a plethora of ways to actually corner and kill the animal. These tactics ranged from chasing American buffalo into snowbanks where their short legs couldn't handle the terrain, or into dead-end canyons where they were trapped at point-blank range. Some tribes would chase herds of buffalo over cliffs, while others would wait for them to cross rivers or bathe in lakes where a retreat was harder to come by. Communal bison hunts, referred to as buffalo jumps, used an assembly line-like approach to butchering the bison. They would first remove the hide before removing the stomach contents. This process had to happen fast, so that the meat wouldn't spoil, but also to cool off the rest of the carcass so that very little meat or resources would be left behind. The first organs to go from the bison were its tongue and then various internal organs. They wouldn't be wasted, however, rather transported to camp where they'd be turned into delicacies. With the bones, members of the buffalo jump would take them and smash the bigger pieces with homemade hammers, pulling out the marrow from within. Bone marrow was both of a preferred taste and incredibly nutritious. It's what kept the butchers going on in such an elongated process. From there, the main section of the body was sliced into 11 different pieces, more for the benefit of those responsible for transporting the meat back to camp. American buffalo meat is exactly like most other meats used for butchering. It's made up of 70 to 75% water, and thus needed to be cut and dried to make for a lighter load. To dry, the sliced meat would first lay flat underneath the sun before being hung over wooden beams above a fire and smoke. This would also add a layer of preservation. Preservation was the name of the game when it came to pemmican, which was heavily used in the long-term storage of foodstuffs for plains tribes. After the slabs of meat were properly dried, they were ready for mixture. First, the preparer would smash the meat into a refined, powder-like substance using a stone hammer or other sturdy, blunt force object. Buffalo fat, or really any form of tallow, would then be added to the crushed meat, mixing the two until fully incorporated. Bone grease was also an instrumental ingredient in some pemmican rituals. Finally, some tribes prepared their pemmican with the aforementioned wild berries picked from the nearby locales. Northern Plains loved making pemmican with dried choke cherries and Saskatoon. Other tribes would stick to the more traditional foraged fruits, such as cranberries or blueberries. However, certain cultures refrained from making pemmican with berries or other sweets outside of ceremonies, such as weddings. 
It was also common to find pemmican mashed with wild bergamot or dried mint. After completing the preparation phase, the final pemmican mixture would be stored in large bags formed from buffalo hide. They were big enough to hold up to over 100 pounds of bison pemmican. However, this was only seen after the horse trade swept through North America. Bags were much smaller and lighter when left up to pure human transportation. Pemmican was introduced to the rest of the world mainly through the Canadian fur trade, after brief recordings of such compacted bison meat meals existed in the writings of James Isham and Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. The peak of the fur trade in the 19th century saw voyagers traversing the northern plains in short spurts, usually during the spring and summer months when the ice melted from rivers and the waters were free to roam. Due to the time crunch, the fur traders turned to food storage and transportation during their voyages. They learned of pemmican from the local plains tribes, and to avoid having to live off the land during the quick warm seasons, they would carry enough preserves to last them through the entire journey. Bison would first be hunted in the southern plains, mixed into pemmican, and then brought back north to trade with the voyagers and other American or Canadian settlers. Pemmican became such a staple of life in the fur trade colonies, an entire war broke out in 1814 between the Hudson Bay Colony and Northwest Company after then-Governor Miles McDonnell stopped all pemmican exports from the recently formed Red River Colony. It supplied Alexander Mackenzie with food and energy during his Trans-America trek from the Atlantic to the Pacific, as well as the North Pole adventurer Robert Peary during all three of his dog-led expeditions. In fact, even the dogs survived eating Peary's excess pemmican rations. Eventually, pemmican reached far sides of the world and was heavily utilized during wartime, such as by the British troops during the Second Boer War and by the French in the Morocco conflicts of the 1920s. Presently, pemmican is most often seen throughout indigenous communities both in America and Canada, eaten as a delicacy, a regular meal, and for ceremonial purposes just like it was prepared during its heyday in the 19th century Great Plains. Flipping from a Native American-based food to a pioneer-based food, the next type of Wild West cuisine is hardtack, also known as sea biscuits or cabin bread. Hardtack was much like pemmican in that it's perfect for long-haul travels and long-term storage, but where it differs is in its incredibly simplistic preparation and bland taste, if you can call it a taste to begin with. Making hardtack was easy. All you had to do was mix a couple cups of flour with three quarter cups of water, with one and a half teaspoons of salt dashed in for good measure. This would net you about 10 to 12 square pieces, so as you can imagine, when prepped for long journeys and storage, much larger batches are made at a time with higher ingredient amounts. Once the mixture was fully incorporated, the baker would touch the dough to make sure it was both a little dry and without any stick. Then, it would be rolled out on a tabletop until the dough was about a half inch thick. The dough slab would then be cut into 3x3 three three inch squares, thrown onto a tray, and heated multiple times in a kiln or oven until the consistency was firm to the touch. In fact, it was so hard, the bread would be inedible without liquid to soften it. It used to be said that one could fire a musket directly into a slab of hardtack, and the musket ball wouldn't ever make it through to the other side. The most common way to soften the hardtack was dipping it in brine or coffee, or frying it on a skillet with other rations. In the late 1700s, it was ground to a fine pulp and used to thicken seafood chowders in the New England communities. Soldiers in the Mexican-American War, and by proxy the Civil War, would crush the hardtack under the butts of their rifles before tossing it in a frying pan, making mushy, gross hardtack pancakes. Others would let it roast on the campfire coals themselves. The luckiest soldiers would turn their hardtack into a dessert. If one was fortunate enough to come across some brown sugar or whiskey, they'd combine the hardtack with whatever sweet element was available to turn into a pudding, as they called it. Hardtack wasn't meant to be enjoyed as fine cuisine or an easy-to-eat biscuit, however. It was designed to last incredibly long periods of time, as long as it stayed dry. If it did, hardtack could last for years, especially if it was cooked four or five times, rather than the customary twice-baked recipes. Usually, hardtack was made six months in advance of using the rations, 
and was a staple for travels that involved inconsistent handling and drastic temperature changes, especially involving heat and humidity. Thus, it's what made hardtack the perfect staple for migrating parties across the Old West and throughout the American frontier in general. Folks on the eastern seaboard could cook up a massive batch of hardtack to last them the months-long journey across the country. The Oregon Trail was a popular place to find families and expeditioners supplied with hardtack, as were mining parties dotting the western landscape. The California Gold Rush was the real heyday for hardtack, as it could feed the mining camps for weeks on end without the need for big game hunting or excess foraging. One of the more famous instances of widespread hardtack trade came in 1801, when businessman and baker Josiah Bent started an outfit in Milton, Massachusetts, where he became famous for his watercrackers. These watercrackers were sold at a premium to the aforementioned gold prospectors and wagon trains due to head west, and Josiah made a fortune on just flour, water, and salt alone, eventually forming the G.H. Bent Company. Down the line, the G.H. Bent Company became famous for their authentic hardtack crackers resembling the same hardtack eaten by soldiers during the Civil War. The Civil War is usually the time period most people associate with hardtack and water crackers at large. Of course, soldiers hated the idea of eating inedible slabs of rock-hard dough, and their distaste was turned into a few different Civil War era songs, such as the parody of Stephen Foster's Hard Times Come Again No More, sung as Hardtack Come Again No More. What most folks don't know about the Civil War hardtack is that it wasn't all made at the time of war. In fact, a good chunk of early Civil War hardtack was leftovers from the Mexican-American War that ended in 1848, some 13 years before the Union fought the Confederacy. As a result, a lot of the hardtack the suffering soldiers were subjected to were infested with worms, especially if the hardtack in question had been stored incorrectly. To avoid eating the worms or other harmful parasites, the soldiers would drop their hardtack into their morning coffee, watch as the weevil larva floated to the top of the cup, then wipe off the worms to be able to eat and drink the rest of the concoction parasite-free. Despite its popularity in 19th century America, hardtack wasn't an invention of the 1800s. Its origins can be traced all the way back to the first processed cereals and creation of flour from wheat, barley, and other grains. The earliest versions of hardtack are thought to be dura cakes made of brittle bread by Egyptian sailors. Biscuit of muslin, a grain mixture of bean flour, rye, and barley, as recorded by King Richard I during the Third Crusade in 1189, and the bread rations provided to the Royal Navy ships starting in 1588, which allowed sailors a pound of hardtack and a gallon of low-alcohol beer. Even as the years have gone on, hardtack's simplistic recipe has remained the same. It's very rarely seen in the average American diet as of present day, but it's not completely extinct from store shelves or the occasional kitchen pantry. The place you're most likely to find modern hardtack is one of the final American frontiers, up north in the state of Alaska. It's where the Richmond, Virginia-based hardtack company, called Interbake Foods, sends 98% of its Sailor Boy hardtack supplies. Alaskans still eat hardtack as a portion of their diet due to the rugged terrain and transportation issues Alaska poses to food suppliers. It's lasted so long in Alaskan households that many folks choose hardtack even when shipments of tastier, more diverse foods are made available in the area. Alaska also features a state law requiring all small aircrafts to maintain survival gear on board the plane. This almost always includes the Sailor Boy hardtack now made synonymous with images of log cabins, airfields, and remote villages across the state of Alaska. The one caveat to Sailor Boy hardtack is its recipe now involves vegetable shortening and leavening, making it not quite the same authentic hardtack you'd see in Civil War reenactments happening in the continental United States to this day. It's for good reason too. Modern technology and food science has brought us well past the age of needing to store bland foods for years at a time. There are no more starving wagon trains or famished mining camps or rundown soldiers to turn to hardtack, making it the perfect symbol of the Wild West simple yet satiating cuisine.